I think we're ready to get started. Good morning. Thank you for joining us for our estate planning and trust webinar. I'm Abby Redden. I'm a, one of the tax partners here at Berman Hopkins. Uh, Jason Berry is joining us. He is a senior PAC tax manager here. And Joe per Percopo is joining us as well. Joe is an attorney with Dean Mead. Uh, he is having some technical difficulties this morning, so uh, I'm not sure we'll have him on video. He's currently working on his audio. His power went out in, at his home uh, just moments ago, so uh, we're going to wing it here. Um, please feel free to share any questions you have via the chat feature. Uh, we'll be happy to answer those questions at the end of the seminar, time permitting. Um, keep in mind that we are recording this seminar, so if you're not able to join us for the entire period, you can always come back and um, rewatch or listen this webinar. Um, and if you have in-depth questions, feel free to reach out to us again after the webinar. Our contact information will be on the final slide. You'll have our phone number, our email, and we'd be happy uh, to reach back out to you and um, answer any of those questions. Um, and Jason is going to start out with the next slide. And uh, hopefully you'll learn something here today and have some great takeaways. All right, thank you, Abby. Um, so I'm gonna jump right into it. I'm gonna say um, when I when I start my you know my slides, I'm not gonna read right off it. So you know I'm gonna leave these slides up for you, and you guys can read them, and then I'll just you know kind of go off of my little tangents as I go. But um, so. You know, I think we all know what an estate is, but I kind of wanted to um, put it in perspective of, you know, how this presentation is going to go. There's going to be the tax side, and then there's also going to be the, the law side of it, you know, the probate side of what is an estate. And um, so when I looked up what an estate is for taxes, you know, I went to the Internal Revenue Code 2031 little a, and in it, let me just move this, it's blocking my view a little bit. Um, I think, you know, I could probably speak for Abby and most tax preparers when I say there's really no love between us and the IRS, but I, I think they nailed, um, their definition of an estate. And so I will read the bottom part of it. And it is the value at the time of his death of all property, real or personable or personal, tangible or in it, intangible, wherever situated, um, and I'm I'm really being honest. It's a great definition. It, the IRS is leaving nothing to the imagination. Uh, they're saying anything real, personable, personable, tangible, intangible, wherever situated. It could be in Brussels. It's going to be part of your taxable estate. Um, that includes, you know, a revocable trust. It includes life insurance, stocks. If it's in your name, it's going in your taxable estate. Um, you know, just to give you a little and, you know, give you a little, little more to it, what the IRS is saying, that they're not joking around, that it's everything. Uh, if you go to irs.gov and you type in 1040, which is a personal return, it's going to only come up two pages. Um, if you, and if you get a return from us, that two pages, it's really, it's a 30 pages because there's always schedules and, you know, statements to go along with it. If you type it, or if Google forgot to do their taxes and they said, crap, we got to do our taxes, and you type in 1120, which is you know uh, a C Corp, it's only six pages. I, I know a lot of our companies we work on are partnerships and S Corps. It's only five pages. They all start at you know, very little pages, and then they turn into you know a lot of our clients, hundreds of pages. Um, an estate tax return starts at 29 pages. I, it's going to be hundreds and hundreds of pages because this is everything that you've, you know, accumulated over your life. The IRS is not saying, or they're not joking when they say it's everything, personal or, or property, real, personal, tangible, intangible, wherever it's situated. Um, an estate for probate purposes it, it is different. I mean, it it does bring in, you know, you know, real estate, possessions, uh, cash, but it's not going to include everything. And Joe's going to hit on this a little bit later when he goes over his probate. 
But um, one of the big differences between uh, you know what goes into a an estate for tax purposes and an estate for probate is a revocable trust. That revocable trust is going to be taxable, or it's going to go into the taxable estate, but it's not going to go into a an estate for probate purposes. Life insurance, because it because there's a beneficiary um, named in it, it's not going to go into uh, the probate. You know, retirement accounts because there's a beneficiary. Is not going to go into probate. So, the purpose of what I, I'm trying to lay out for is um, there's going to be two different hats here. There's going to be the, you know, the Abby and me are going to, you know, kind of, you know, stick to the tax side of what is an estate, and then Joe is going to hit on more of a, you know, what goes into the probate or the law side of an estate. And then, you know, what is tax or what is estate planning? I'm sorry. Um, when, when I think of this, you know, it's not, you know, I'm not, again, I'm not going to read off it, but it's not going to be a, you know, let's sit down one time and get this done. You're going to meet your attorney, you're going to go over it, and it's going to be, you know, what do you have, how do you want to disperse it? Um, it's not, I mean, it's, you know, when I think of engineers, I think, you know, they're, they're very detailed even them, they're not going to get in there and out of there in one day. It's going to be a process. Um, so you go over everything. You go over, you know, your life insurance, your cash, your, you know, who do you want it to go to, your kids, your wife, your charity. Um, it's it's going to take a while, but it is very important to do the estate planning, whether it's, you know, obviously the sooner the better, because you you don't want to let it go too far without, you know, um, in, in your life before you start doing it. Um, and why do you do estate planning? So because I'm a tax person, I'm going to lead by saying to minimize taxes. Um, you want to protect your family's wealth and your future generation's wealth. And you know, I, I jokingly say this, but it's very true. When I think of my parents um, and my children, my I'll, I'll give you the example that I have is my, I, me and my wife took a, a short vacation. It was a Sunday to Wednesday vacation to St. Augustine. My parents live in Michigan. We said, hey, do you wanna come down and watch the kids? And they said, yes. They came down. Wednesday afternoon and left Thursday morning. Basically, they came down just to watch the kids and wanted nothing to do with me after that. I think they only came down um, Saturday afternoon so they could get the free dinner that I paid for. Basically, where I'm going is a lot of the time, maybe not a lot of the time, in my case at least, you know, you, you the parents want to take care of their grandchildren as well. They just don't want to take care of, you know, their their sons, their daughters. Um, so it is. It's about minimizing tax to keep wealth for you know, you know, not just your children but your grandchildren. And it is. It's for the the estate tax is forty percent. So you've worked your entire life, and let's say you were always in the tax bracket, the highest tax bracket. Um, right now it's 37%. It's been, it certainly has been higher. Even a few years ago, it was almost 40%. You've paid tax on it at 37%. If you pass away or when you pass away, and if you're over the, I mean, it's going to be, it's roughly $13 million in 2023. Anything over that $13 million, if you, do, if you're not planning for it, is going to be taxed at 40%. So do you really want the, the IRS, the government, to get an additional 40% on something you've already paid tax on? Uh, wouldn't you rather give it to your son or your, in my, in my family's case, my, my, my children? It's going to skip right past me. But there are, you know, obviously there are other issues besides tax. And um, the big hairy monster is always probate. It's um, 
you know, you want to minimize the need for probate. It's time consuming. It costs money. Um, when I think of probate, I always think of it's, it's got to be the top, one of the top scariest things that America, if you did a poll, Americans would say, you know, what are the top scary things? They would say being buried alive, spiders, probate, and clowns, and probably in that order. So it's, it is one of those things that you want to avoid. There's, if you can avoid it, you know, let's avoid it. Sometimes you can't avoid it, but it is certainly one of those things where you want to avoid probate. Um, and then, you know, I'm going to talk about distributing assets in the intended manner and it's personal um, in, in the same breath, because when, you know, I, my, my example for this is my, my wife's grandfather passed away. He didn't have much. He, I mean, very little. He had a house, he had retirement, and that was all that was in his will. It was, you know, he had four children and it got dispersed 25% to each. Where I say, you know, you got to think of everything because there's, there's, you know, emotions happen after death. Um, my mother-in-law, as we were sitting in his house in Ohio, we were, you know, drinking bush light because that's what he drank. So we're like, all right, let's, let's drink bush light and, uh, you know, talk about, you know, who, who gets all this other stuff in the house. And my mother-in-law said, she wants the silverware. My, I guess not my, but, uh, one of the, one of the daughters, one of the true daughters said, well, I want the silverware. Um, you know, the, the daughter got the silverware and it was 10 years before they talked again. And there is no way, and they were a close family. This, this is, this is not, you know, they just got together out of, you know, just because of the funeral, they were a close family. And 10 years later, they still weren't talking over silverware. Um, what I'll say, and this is, you know, I, I think this probably makes me look bad, but every time I go up to Michigan where my parents are, my mom will say, what do you want? And I say, I don't want anything because everything she has, it's not something that I want. So hopefully, you know, when they pass away, it won't be, or it will go smooth, but it, it, it's, it is, it's, it is in a sense, it's a type of planning. It's she's saying, Hey, I will set this aside for you. And I will say, Jason gets whatever this thing is. Um, but obviously, you know, when we're talking about, you know, a larger estate, you, you want to plan for that. You don't want to just, you know, just on a whim, kind of like what happened to my, my grandfather or my wife's grandfather. You don't want an argument over something that, um, that could have been avoided. And then the estate planning process. Um, the first thing, and I kind of already talked about is take an inventory. Um, it's, it's going to take time. <laughs> and even when I say this, like if, if, if I would have passed away, I would have never thought, you know, silverware would have been an issue. So I probably wouldn't have even thought that, but I'm sure if, you know, if you go to Joe and you say, Hey, I need an estate planning, um, he would say, give me everything. Even if you think it doesn't mean anything, tell me, or yeah, just tell me everything you got. Um, account or family matters or family needs. Um, you know, obviously take care of your family if you want to. Uh, and then, I, you know, I have a, I have a client that, and this is, you know, it was an inherited client and I was talking to her and she said, I'm thinking about, you know, changing up my trust. And I said, okay, so right now it's, what is it? 50, 50 to your two daughters. She's like, no, right now it's, they get 5%. They, they each get 5%. The remaining 90% goes to my church. Um, what, what, where I'm going with this is they didn't need the money. They, she took into account that they were already well off. They didn't need all that money, the rest. So she took it into account the family needs and it only was, they only need 5%. The rest can go to her church or her charity. Um, establishing directives, you know, the living wills, the medical, the medical decisions, you know, if you, were to become in a vegetative state, um, what do you want to happen? Um, review beneficiaries. It's one of those, um, you, you always hear it. 
maybe not always, but you hear it a lot. An ex-wife, an ex-husband is still the beneficiary of whatever. This is when you really solidify that should not be there. I want my new wife or it should go to my kids. Um, so that is definitely part of the estate planning. And then it takes a team. Um, as much as I want to say it's, you know, the tax professionals are the most important, you know, it, it's a whole team that goes into it. You know, the life insurance specialist. Um, sometimes I have a client, they don't have very much outside of their corporations. They put everything back into their corporation. So what happens at that point when, if their estate is over the, the threshold um, and they have to pay tax, that's where the life insurance specialist comes in. That's when your life insurance will give you that those liquid assets right off the bat and you'll be able to pay the estate as you're trying to figure out how to, um, I guess, get the money out of the S Corp if you don't want it anymore. Um, the trustee, you, you know, you want a good trustee that you trust, you know, your investment advisor, the one that's taking the stocks and making money off it. Um, and then of course the attorney, they, I don't actually know the percentage of how much they do compared to everybody else, but it's got to be the lion's share. Um, so they are probably the most important part of the estate planning. Obviously, the tax professionals, we can come in and um, answer the questions, answer the the more detailed tax questions. But Joe, uh, you know, any estate attorney is probably going to be the 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 driver of the seat. And, you know, I, I did take business law one and business law two. So I am practically an attorney, but um, I still haven't, I have not passed the bar yet, but until then, you know, I I'll leave, you know, that, that over on the attorney side. So um, I will now turn it over to Joe and uh, he can take over. Joe and Joe he's oh. he's on but he's muted so he needs oh. to uh, unmute to be able to Let me see okay can, okay can can you guys hear me now yep we got you okay sorry about that thank you Jason and uh, my apologies to the rest of the audience today as Abby mentioned about five minutes before this presentation started, my house lost power. But fortunately, OUC said they'll have it back up by noon. Doesn't help us here, but uh, as long as you guys can hear me, you've got the slides, I think we'll still be able to convey the uh, necessary information without having to see my face on the screen. So I was going to start briefly to kind of describe, what, you know, what when is probate necessary? So probate becomes necessary, and it, it is the process of legally transferring ownership of an asset after someone has died when the asset was titled just in their name and there's no beneficiary on it. So it, it's, you know, when you have multiple owners, it could pass without being part of the probate process. But as Jason pointed out, that's still part of your gross estate for federal tax purposes. So when you're thinking of planning, there's the federal estate tax planning, which Abby is going to talk more about a little bit hereafter. And then there's the estate planning with regards to probate. And probate is just going to be those assets that were left in your name that you forgot to add a beneficiary to that now we have to go to the court and ask the court to go ahead and, and legally transfer these assets. So when we're looking at probate, there's two types of situations. We have intestate and testate. And intestate simply means you didn't have a will when you passed away. Estate means you had a will. When you don't have a will, Florida has been kind enough to write a will for you in the statutes. So you're stuck with the default distributions, which may work. It may get it to the person you wanted. But when you have second marriage situations with children from different uh, relationships, the default actually doesn't leave it all to your spouse. The default is only half the spouse, half to all children of yours. So intestate very often doesn't do what you want. And that's where the will comes in. So when you have the will, that's going to be able to control in a little bit more detail what happens. Now, when we get into the actual probate process, there's formal probates and summary probates. 
summaries are for small estates under $75,000 worth of assets, and they're shorter, faster, and cheaper. And to give you, you know, those on the call perspective here, a summary probate still would cost someone probably somewhere between $2,500 and $3,500 to get through. Now, contrast that with a formal probate. As the name implies, it's a lot more formal. You have to get an executor appointed. You have to publish a whole notice to creditors. You've got to gather assets, aggregate them. You got to deal with creditor claims, get the taxes squared away. And then eventually, you know, nine months to a year later, do you actually get to distributing assets to beneficiaries? And that formal probate, you're looking at something that could be anywhere from you know four thousand to fifty five hundred dollars, and that's those those cost ranges are just for simple things where there's not these complexities that crop up and pop into the probate process. So you know probate is not the end of the world; it's just not ideal because you're spending more money and more time going through it when with other planning you could essentially circumvent that probate piece. Now. That's not in and of itself going to circumvent the estate tax side of things, uh, but it'll at least keep you out of state court dealing with probate. Now, even when you're trying to avoid probate, it's still good to have a will because it does say where your assets go. In case you forget something, you miss something, you're still going to ensure, hey, it's going to my spouse and not to my children or to my favorite charity, you know, whatever it might be. It's also critical because it allows you to direct who's going to be in charge. So who, who's your executor? Now, Florida calls it a personal representative, but everyone commonly knows it as the executor role. And that's the person who's going to run with it, go to court, handle it for you. But another major benefit the will provides is it's a spot to designate who's going to be the guardian when you have minor children. And that's very important because you know the courts are going to give great deference to what you have specified in writing as to who you want to take care of and raise your children. So, th so the will has other functionality besides just the app that it makes your intent known, which is very important. And wills can get a little bit more sophisticated, so they can even be designed, you know, especially when you have young kids, that a, a trust gets set up into the future to hold those assets after someone passes away. And um, Jason's going to discuss more about what is, what is a trust here shortly, so I'll let him kind of explain more of that when, when he gets to that section. Um, but for those that are looking to avoid probate, Jason's going to talk about how the trust functions, but there's other simpler things, too, that you can be looking for. One is joint ownership. Um, you could have assets that you own with rights of survivorship with your parents, with your spouse, um, things you can own jointly as a married couple. And those are set up by operation of law. When one person dies, it passes to the survivors. There is no probate. It doesn't have to go through the court system. You know, the other big one is beneficiary designations. You know, going through, you know, a lot of bank accounts these days, you can put, hey, if I die, pay this account too. They're called pay on death or transfer on death. And you can name, you know, three kids, four kids, however many you have as that beneficiary. So again, by adding those beneficiaries, you're avoiding probate with a bank account. And of course, with retirement accounts, life insurance, those commonly have beneficiary designations, but sometimes clients don't look beyond their primary, where most of these types of accounts, you can name a contingent to say, hey, I'm leaving it to my wife, but if my wife's not there, then my contingent beneficiaries are my two children. And doing that's going to help to avoid probate. And again, when you look back, probate can be you know, costly, so it's, it's certainly not bad if we can get away from it. Now, one final thing I want to point out, and, and some may have heard of this term, or it's called a ladybird deed. It's, uh, it's a special kind of deed that Florida allows, it's very unique to Florida, where we can say while we're alive, we retain full use of our real property. But upon our death, if we haven't done anything different, you know, given the property away, sold it to someone else, upon our death, we can say who the property goes to. So what happens then is for your real property, you have the ladybird deed and die, it's going to pass to your children, no probate. So very often you have clients in situations where they've got, you know, investable assets, their retirement accounts, um, and, you know, these life insurance policies, well, if they name beneficiaries on those, 
that leaves their house, their homestead. That's normally the biggest thing that, okay, we're going to have to probate. Well, something like the ladybird deed is a very inexpensive way to have the homestead pass automatically at death, and you can avoid probate in its entirety with those combination of things. So with that, I'll turn it over to Abby so she can talk to you next about estate taxation. Thank you, Joe. Um, so um, currently, uh, Jason alluded to earlier, individuals can leave their heirs up to just over $12 million without any federal estate tax. So that's a combined exemption of just over $24 million for married couples. Or you can gift that same amount throughout your lifetime. And these, this amount is adjusted each year for inflation. So for 2023, the amount increases to almost 13 million. So it actually doubled under the 2018 tax reform, but it is set to expire. So on January 1st of 2026, the exemption is set to drop back to what it was before 2018, which was $5 million. So it will be adjusted for inflation in January of 2026, but that's a pretty steep haircut. Um, <clears throat> but currently, since the exemption amount is so high, only about something less than 1% of estates actually paid estate tax in 2020. So in the year 2020, 3.4 million Americans died, but only about 1,200, 1,300 actually paid an estate tax. Um, and the estate tax, again, like Jason mentioned, uh, there is a graduated tax rate. It starts at 18% up to 39%, but everything over a million dollars in your taxable estate is taxed at the top rate of 40%. And that's when the fair market value, again, of your estate exceeds the, that $12 million this year or almost $13 million next year. Uh, there are some proposals on the table that um, would increase estate taxes by essentially rolling back the gift and estate tax rates and exemptions to probably the 2009 levels of about three and a half million dollar exemption. So again, something to um, be on the lookout for, uh, but currently as a married couple, 24 million, uh, if you are to die today, would be um, estate tax free. Now that's from the IRS's perspective. <clears throat> Florida does not have an estate tax. However, there are some states that do have an estate tax. Um, there's less than a dozen out there, but there are also states that have inheritance taxes. So the beneficiaries of the estate would need to pay taxes as well. Um, and to my knowledge, there's only one state, that's Maryland, that has both the estate and the inheritance tax. So for those of you listening, if you're here in Florida, we are very fortunate to live and die here in Florida so that we only have to deal with the IRS. Um, now, amounts that are left to spouses who are US citizens and amounts left to charities are not subject to estate tax. And there is an alternate valuation date, which is six months after the date of death. So there is elect an election that uh, you can make to effectively lower the estate, federal estate tax bill, unless those assets were sold within that six month period of after date of death. And the estate tax return is due nine months after date of death, which means that's when the taxes are due. Uh, there is an extension. You can extend the filing of the estate tax return for six months, but there is no extension to pay. So at times liquidity becomes an issue if cash is tied up in businesses or, or real estate that uh, you have to convert those to cash within nine months to pay the IRS. There also is an option, uh, it's called portability. And what that does, it, it allows the surviving spouse the ability to transfer the unused exemption from the, dece the deceased spouse. So for estate tax purposes, the surviving spouse has their own 12 million and the deceased spouse is whatever's left of their 12 million. But you must make that portability election on a timely filed estate tax return. 
including that extension period. So even if there's no requirement to file an estate tax return, the, the estate is not taxable, you must file an estate tax return to make that portability election so that the spouse gets their deceased spouse's portion of that exemption. Um, and what is included in an estate, I know Jason covered this earlier, um, but it is everything that is owned individually and in a trust at date of death, plus gifts made throughout your lifetime. And those gifts are valued at the fair market value at the time of the gift. So just to clarify, gifts made during your lifetime are part of your estate at death. However, any appreciation after you gifted those assets does escape estate taxation. So annual gifting really is one of the easiest ways to reduce your estate tax. It not only reduces the taxable estate, but it also allows you to share your wealth with your loved ones or your friends during your lifetime. So you can see them enjoy the gifts while you're still alive versus after your death when you're no longer around. So the annual exclusion for this year is 16,000 per person. So if you split the gift with your spouse, jointly the two of you can give an individual $32,000 in 2022. That amount per person increases next year to 17,000 per person. And there is no limit to the number of people that you can give gifts to. Um, and there's also no limitation on gifts to spouses who are US citizens. That's known as the marital deduction. Um, there are some gifting strategies to think about. Um, you can make unlimited direct gifts for tuition or for medical expenses. Uh, the federal gift tax law allows for unlimited gifts if those gifts are given in the form of a direct payment for qualifying education or medical expenses. You can also contribute to a 529 plan. Those contributions qualify for the annual gift tax exclusion but uh, you also are able to combine up to five years worth of exclusions in one lump payment for a contribution to a 529 plan. Uh, so you could give up to $80,000 per beneficiary. These 529 plans, they're also very flexible. So it allows the plan owner for the donor to change the beneficiary at will. So if you set up a 529 plan for uh, your children and for each of your children, but one chooses not to go to college, you're able to change that beneficiary to say a grandchild or a friend, you know, whoever you will, uh, whoever um, you decide at will. Um, you can also make direct payments to cover bills, you know, instead of giving gifting cash, you can choose to make those direct payments. So that might be a good solution in cases where it's preferable to avoid giving cash to individuals. Um, you definitely, though, do want to choose when to give your gift uh, very carefully. So there are advantages to giving early or at specifically strategic times. So if you give early in the year, that what that does is that transfers any appreciation-based income from the donor's tax return to the beneficiary's tax return. So I gift in early January, any income that that asset generated is no longer taxable to me for income tax purposes. It's taxable to uh, the individual that I gifted that asset to. Um, and, and you may also choose to give a particular gift when the value of the asset is down based on market prices. So, um, and like I mentioned, definitely give gifts that will appreciate in value and hold on to those that have already appreciated or have depreciated. Um, cash is nice to gift, but it's also very easily spent. So sometimes it's a better option to give someone property that you expect will appreciate over time. So not only does that deter them from liquidating the asset in the short term, it also removes that future appreciation from your estate. Um, so again, choosing the property that you gift, choose, choose the property wisely. Hold, you want to hold on to assets that have already appreciated substantially while you owned them, because 
if you gift that, your gift recipient, the beneficiary, get, receives carryover basis. They will have the same basis that you have in that appreciated property. So if they sell that property, they will own capital gains on the total appreciation since you've owned it because their basis is your basis and they sell it, it's appreciated, they have a capital gain. Um, whereas if that asset remains in your estate, they will get a step up in basis to the fair market value at your date of death if they inherit that property upon your death. So again, it's best to hold on to those assets. If the value um, has decreased while you've owned it, you can sell the property, deduct the loss on your own return and gift the cash proceeds. Um, and Jason, I will turn it over to you to cover what is a trust. Thank you, Abby. And I wanted to apologize. Um, I skipped over um, Joe's, um, his slides. Uh, but, you know, if you, if you want to see them, I can, you know, certainly get these over to you. But um, so what is, an, what is a trust? Um, you know, I said I wasn't going to read off, but I am going to read off on this one. Uh, a trust is a fiduciary arrangement that allows a third party or a trustee to hold assets on behalf of a, of a beneficiary or beneficiaries. Um, if you're on this webinar, you probably know what a trust is, you know, you know, exactly what that was. Um, I think there are times when it's a revocable trust and you kind of have to put on a second hat. And when I say that it's the revocable trust, you're the trustor, you're the one, you know, putting the assets in there. Uh, you're the trustee, you're the one, you know, managing that trust. And then you're the income beneficiary um, and, until you pass where you're the one, you know, kind of reaping the benefits of it. So even though you put it in this trust, nothing really changed. And, it, and it's a hard concept to grasp until you think about it. When you look at, you know, your, your stocks and it says, it doesn't say Jason Berry on it anymore. It says Jason Berry revocable trust. You have to put your mind in it. Okay, those are not my assets anymore. Those assets are legally titled in that trust name. And it's, it, even though nothing changed, you know, from any aspect, you're still going life as normal. Nothing changed. Those assets are not yours anymore. They they are owned by that trust. Could you revoke it? Yes. That is one of the benefits of a revocable trust. But, um, you know, where I was trying to get with this is you have to realize even though nothing changed, you know, everything did change because that trust owns all those, uh, all that property that you put in there. Uh, functions of a trust, you know, the big one is, it, it, you know, it avoids probate. You put it in a trust, it's going to go straight to the, to the beneficiaries. Um, It, you know, we've hit on it. We, I just want to make sure if, if it is a, a, a revocable trust, it still goes into your taxable estate. It's going to avoid probate. It's going to go straight to the beneficiaries, but it does go um, into the taxable estate. Irrevocable is different. And I believe Joe is going to talk about that a little later, but um, it does avoid probate. And that's one of the main functions of a trust. Um, the privacy. Um, because it's in a trust, it does not go through probate, which means it does not go into public record. Um, you know, I, I say this, you know, with a smile because I don't know who would even look up. I, don't, I, I honestly don't even know how to look up public records. I don't know who would look up pro public records, but if, if it goes through probate, it's, you know, it's open to the public and you can see what was in your will. Um, but it, it does provide privacy. No one sees that you know, besides the attorneys or your your trusted advisors. Um, and there is some tax planning. Um, one of the ones that, you know, I think of whenever I think of tax planning is, you know, it's a life insurance trust where you can pay the premiums and, you know, Joe might be able to, you know, give me a little bit more insight on this, but I, you pay the premiums to the trust, the trust owns that life insurance. And upon your death, that that life insurance in that trust, 
goes, I mean, it's still going to go tax free, but it's also doesn't go into the estate uh, for taxes. So it, it avoids, you know, a bump up. So if you have $13 million of assets and you have a, a $5 million uh, life insurance trust, that $5 million life insurance trust is not going to go into the uh, the estate process for taxes. So you just saved yourself 40% on that $5 million. It has to be set up correctly. It has to, you know, there are stringent um, rules that you have to follow to get it, but it certainly is a way to tax plan. Um, kind of on the same note, but not, not necessarily a tax planning, but, you know, conserving property for the beneficiaries. Um, it's a special needs trust. If you have a son or daughter that has special needs, you know, you could set up a irrevocable trust over here, put some stock or money in that irrevocable trust. And when the government is looking for, or when you're applying for government assistance, that special needs trust is not brought into the equation. They're just looking at, you know, the assets of your special needs child. So, you know, you have a trust over here that, you know, is irrevocable and it's, you know, benefiting them, but the government doesn't see that. Um, they only see what's in the child's bank or not child, but, you know, your son or daughter's bank account or whatever it is. And then tax planning, you know, the charity, you can give it all the way to charity. You can give some of it to charity and it doesn't, it's not, and it's going to, you know, um, however you want to set it up, you can set it up to give the charity. Uh, so the main roles in a trust, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to go over this quick. Again, I think everyone on here probably knows these roles, but I'm just going to quickly go through them. The grantor, that's the one who establishes the trust. You know, the trustee, that's the person who manages the trust assets. And then there's the beneficiaries. And there's, when I think of it, there's usually two different kinds. There's the income beneficiary who, you know, in a, in a revocable trust, that's usually you. And then, you know, when you pass away or whoever passes away, the spouse is usually the income beneficiary after that. But then the remainder men are the ones that are the ones that are getting the assets after, you know, after both pass or after, you know, just you pass, however it works out. Or it could be, you know, in my parents' case, it would probably be the grandchildren would get it or the, you know, your favorite charity, your church. Um, there are, you know, multiple or two, you know, a couple different kinds of beneficiaries. Um, and then the trust director, um, it's also the trust protector. It's a, it's a newer concept that's, it's kind of, you know, picking up some traction. Um, and Joe, you can certainly chime in here, but from, it's, it's almost like that person's, and this person does not have to be part of a trust. The other three do. You need a grantor, you need the trustee, you need the beneficiaries. A trust director doesn't necessarily have to be part of a trust, but you could do it. Um, it's a third party and it's usually an attorney um, and they're given the power to, within the trust to do the, to do the right thing um, when it becomes an irrevocable trust. So, and the example that, you know, kind of gets that got my head wrapped around it is, and Joe, let me know, um, is, you know, you set up a trust 20 years ago, you had two kids at that point. In that trust, it said, I want to give 50% to my daughter. I want to give 50% to my son. And then you forgot all about that trust. You then had another child somewhere down the line, and then you pass away, and it's still in there says, I want to give 50% to my daughter. I want to give 50% to my son. I think the trust protector can come in and do the right thing and say, hey, I know what it said 20 years ago. That's not the situation now. I'm going to say there's three children. We're going to give it all, you know, 30, 33% each. That the trust protector could also, if the trustee was not following the trust, they could, that trust protector could remove that trustee. Um, it, you know, it is picking up traction because you don't really want to leave anything unturned when you're doing your trusts or your estate planning. So um, it certainly is a good concept 
to have. And I'm going to pass this back over to Joe. Thank you, Jason. Uh, a quick comment, just following up on the trust director piece, is you know envision this as a third person, so it's not someone who's related to you, it's not one of your employees, that you can choose to give certain specific special powers. So like Jason alluded to, that could be the power to amend, could be the power to remove trustees. It could also be someone who has to give special permission for certain kinds of distributions. And, you know, um, it, it's in revocable trust, you don't t tend to see the trust director so much. But in irrevocable trust, it is very popular because the trust is irrevocable. It limits you as the creator from being able to change it. But you can set up a trust director with those kind of powers. So now, you know, speaking of, you know, revocable, irrevocable, uh, that's kind of our two main trust types. So they're, all trusts are going to fall into one of those two categories. And we're going to first talk about some of the irrevocable trusts here. So Jason, if you could advance to the irrevocable trust slide. So as the name implies, these are trusts that generally you can't change. Once you set them up, they're established. Now, the trust director is an example of one way to allow subsequent changes to this irrevocable trust. Uh, but there's also ways under the law and, and Florida statutes where it is still possible to change an irrevocable trust. So, you know, we joke that an irrevocable trust is not irrevocable because there are ways that you can modify it after the fact. It, it is more, take a lot more effort and there is a cost to doing it. Um, but it is possible. And sometimes the situations really call for it. And Jason's example is a perfect one. Dad set it up for two kids, named them specifically as opposed to just a general, my children, as a third. That's something he, he's going to want to amend if he realizes it while he's alive to, to fix that distribution and even it up. Now, one trust that is not super popular that is sometimes important is what's called a homestead trust. And this comes in because in Florida, when it comes to your homestead, you have certain constitutional restrictions on what you can do with it. If you have a spouse or a minor child, the state of Florida says how your house can pass. So sometimes we have clients that, you know, have a minor child still. They have a very valuable house that is owned outright, so it's 100% equity. And if it's their homestead, Florida law says if they die, that house goes right to their child. That minor child, so when that minor turns 18, he or she can do whatever they want with that house. They can sell it, you know, have a big party. I mean, they're in total control. Generally, we don't like to give 18-year-olds a whole lot of money uh, because how it gets used is not always the most responsible. So this irrevocable homestead trust is something where a parent could put the homestead into a trust and the trust has terms, so it still qualifies for the creditor protection and, and homestead tax benefits that you receive. And it basically provides, with its language, say, when my youngest child turns 18, the house comes back to me. And if we set that kind of trust up, we avoid that devised restriction in the Constitution. So it's not a common trust. It is very specific. But when it's needed, I mean, it, it can be critical if you've got someone with, you know, a $2 million house, you don't want an 18-year-old inheriting something like that and, and having outright control. Another more popular type of trust is, that's irrevocable is a marital trust. And this kind of goes back to the tax planning that Abby was mentioning and that Jason mentioned as far as that you can use trust for. So the marital trust is a... a a special kind of trust where you can put assets into it and that you can do it while you're alive or the assets can go into it after you're gone. The big benefit is the assets that go into it, you get a marital deduction. So if you have $100 worth of assets and you put all $100 into the marital trust, then you get a deduction. So the IRS looks at it as though there's nothing that's taxable. So, you know, that planning, the, the benefit there is that marital trust can still control the assets. It has to let income come out to your spouse at least annually. So that, that's part of the requirement to be this qualified trust. But it lets you say if discretionary payments can come out, that's up to you. Uh, do you want to let your spouse 
specify with a power of appointment where assets go when your spouse dies. Um, or what's more common, especially in second marriage situations, is you're directing it perhaps back to your children from a prior relationship. So it's very common. You have a married couple. They each had two kids with prior relationship, no common children, but they want to take care of the other spouse and at the same time protecting the assets so they go back to their children. Because if you leave everything outright to the other spouse, that surviving spouse may originally say, I'm going to divide it four ways, but 10, 15 years, they may just leave it all to their children and cut out the deceased spouse's children. So the marital trust is a nice, safe way to say, hey, I'm going to have all my money go in the trust. It's going to benefit my spouse. But when my spouse dies, that money goes back to my kids, family, charity, whoever it might be. The other thing about the marital trust, because you got that deduction, that means those assets are included in your spouse's estate. So this is very commonly used when you have estate tax exposure, rather than pay a 40% tax because your estate is over that you know, $12, $13 million threshold, whatever is over that threshold, you can just drop into a marital trust, you get a deduction, and then no taxes are going to be due. So the marital trust is very popular. For those on the call who did estate planning you know, 10, 15 years ago, uh, a lot of your documents are likely set up to split into two kinds of trusts, one of which is this marital trust. So it, it, it is a very common, uh, commonly used out there because of the, the tax benefits it can offer. Now, the other types of irrevocable trusts that follow here on this slide, these really tie in more with advanced tax planning. So going back to Abby's conversation about the exemption being, you know, 12, 13 million next year, but dropping back to, you know, 5 million index for inflation in 2026, you know, there are folks that are in that taxable exposure range then, and a 40% tax is pretty rough. So these trusts that follow here on the slide, their general function is trying to get assets out of the estate earlier and use that $12, $13 million exemption while we have it before it drops and keep all that future growth, as Abby indicated, out of the, your estate. So, you know, the gift trust, an irrevocable gift trust, very commonly, those are set up for children or grandkids. And, you know, what we very often will do is when we have a client who has a valuable business, like Jason said, most of the business is your, you know, your whole asset, we can recapitalize the business with voting and non-voting shares, and then make a gift of some of those non-voting shares to the grandchildren's trust. So what we've done is you've moved, you know, 10% of your economic value out of your business to your grandkids, all of the future growth, you know, if the company's later sold for, you know, two, three, five X, all that growth is not in your estate. It's outside of the estate tax now. So you get that future freeze, that growth out, which is phenomenal. But the other thing with that technique is if you give 10% non-voting shares to someone, it's worth less than 10% because they're non-voting. They have no control. Who's going to want to buy them? So you're, you know, if you had a hundred dollar business, 10% of the business would be 10 bucks. But in reality, because no one's going to want to buy it, it's not worth $10. That business interest is actually probably worth maybe six or $7. So what you're doing again is you're transferring more for less by using these gift trusts. The, the spousal lifetime access trust flat has grown significantly in popularity with this impending drop to the uh, state tax in 2026, but it functions, it, it, it's trying to do the same thing as the irrevocable gift trust. Uh, it's moving assets out of an estate, getting that, that future growth out of the estate, taking advantage of that exemption while you have it. Because in 2026, when that $13 million exemption drops back to half, if you didn't use it, you have lost it. And it's kind of a use it all or lose it type of situation. So that's where you'll see these slats, and that's where it's not set up necessarily for the children, but it's for your spouse. So a husband can create an irrevocable spousal trust for his wife. A wife can create one for her husband. Uh, you know, spouses can create one for the other spouse, the other spouse, you know, back and forth. And you can shift assets out of the estate and still have some degree of control. But those have to be carefully considered based on, you know, your situation, what your tax exposure is, and also to understand, hey, if I put, you know, uh, five million bucks in my husband's, uh, you know, 
trust, this irrevocable flat, well, if we get divorced, that money may be gone and not marital. So you've got to keep certain other factors like that in mind. And also, I put five million in my husband's trust and then he dies. Well, now I don't have access to that five million because if I had access to it, well, then that creates this issue of, well, then is it includable in my estate? And that defeats all the tax planning that we're doing. So the spousal trust is a very useful tool, especially, you know, if you have estates that are 25 million and up, you, the slats are something that, you know, generally are going to be strongly considered because of the tax planning benefits that they're offering. The other ones here I'm going to hit on real quickly, the irrevocable life insurance trust Jason mentioned, that is just a, a trust designed to hold life insurance to do exactly what Jason said keep the death benefits from being part of your taxable estate. So it's not, it's not free in the sense of I can take out a $5 million plan and I haven't used any estate tax because someone has to pay for that plan. Usually that's you. So you make a gift to your irrevocable life insurance trust and then it pays the policy. But you, you're in generally, you know, you could shift out maybe a hundred thousand dollars worth of costs. And uh, with, with the life insurance trust, you may get a million dollar policy in return. So yeah, you gifted a million bucks or excuse me, a hundred thousand and your exemption gets reduced a little bit, but you've got a million dollar policy now that doesn't get hit with that 40% tax that, that you were otherwise exposed to. Uh, the uh, qualified personal residence trust, this is just a way you can basically take your home Put it into a trust. You get to say we can live here for X number of years, and after those years end, it goes to our children. And because of that, the gift, if the house is worth a million dollars, based on the time frame you have the entitlement to the house, you're not making a gift of a million dollars to your kids because they're not getting the immediate full use of it. So it's a way to get more out of your estate and have it count less for federal tax purposes. Grant or retained annuity trust, same thing. Uh, those are going to be less popular as income taxes go up. That was just kind of a way to try to game the system of I put money into this trust. It has to pay me back for a term of years, uh, a set dollar amount. So the idea is, well, if I can put in, you know, 100 bucks in this grat and earn an 8 percent, you know, return and it's only going to pay me back, you know, a 2 percent gain. I've just got 6 percent growth outside of my estate that's going to my beneficiary tax rate and the grats have commonly been the target of Congress because you have the you know, Walton family you know, that, that handled uh, that's behind Walmart. They have used these uh, to avoid significant amounts of tax. And a charitable remainder trust, that's for those that are charitably inclined. It it's lets you kind of have more control over the assets and then you're going to get a deduction. So it doesn't count. Uh, well, it's not going to create an estate tax liability for you. So a nice benefit. Um, so I, those are the main irrevocable trusts. Now we're going to switch to the revocable trust. So Jason, if you could advance that slide. All right. Revocable, these are, you know, similar. Uh, it's while you're alive, you're, you have total control. So you can create a trust for yourself. That's an individual trust. And by the way, when you create trust for yourself in Florida, there is no creditor protection. You can't do that in Florida. So sometimes clients think, oh, I want a trust to protect assets. Well, it doesn't work like that. You can set up a trust for your kids that's creditor protected or a trust for your spouse that's creditor protected. But if you're your own beneficiary, even if it's irrevocable, your creditors can get into it. So the, the main function, which has been you know, explained by Jason with the revocable trust, is you're getting to avoid probate. It's while you're alive, the trust is for your benefit, complete use, but upon you know, death, it essentially has your will provisions built into it and says where assets go. So it's the probate avoidance factor that's probably the, the most common reason people look to the trust. Another situation where a trust is going to be almost always used is when you have real property in different states. Because generally, real property, you have to do a probate in each state where the real property is located. So very often, if clients you know, come in and say, hey, I've got a vacation house in Georgia or wherever, we're heavily going to be looking at the trust because using it, we put the Georgia property in your revocable trust, you die, we don't have to do a probate in Georgia. 
So it, it saves you know, significant costs in, in, in those situations. There's also things that I'm sure most of you have heard, land trusts. Those are very specific in the sense that they're just designed to hold land. The typical reason for those is people don't want their names to show up in the public records. So celebrities very commonly use these kind of things. So you can't just go and you know, Google where their house is and see their assets in like a public record search. So uh, another kind of revocable trust that you can have is a joint trust. So that's you know, generally going to be between a married couple. And you set it up and you put your assets into it together. The trust is used for your benefit, you know, as long as one of you is alive. And it does give you flexibility. So you can have it, hey, we can change it while we're both alive. But the moment one of us dies, boom, the terms are locked up and the survivor's stuck. They can't change it after the fact and cut out people that we agreed that we wanted to benefit when we were both gone. So the joint trust, you know, can be very useful. That's something, though, when you've got blended families and children from prior relationships, the joint trust can be a lot more challenging to use. Uh, because of the commingling of assets and trying to control which family is benefiting from whose assets that were put into it. Uh, the last revocable trust I was going to touch on before we get into, you know, some of the estate planning mistakes that I see in practice is something called the Community Property Trust. This is actually a new trust that Florida enacted last July, and it's a special kind of trust that if you put assets into it, the assets that go into that trust, it's got to be between a married couple. And no one else can be the be, uh, grantors of the trust. You have to legally be married. And if you put assets into it, the assets in the trust are going to be considered community property assets. Why does that matter? As Abby mentioned earlier, she said when someone dies and they pass that asset to the next beneficiary, the basis the beneficiary gets is equal to the fair market value of that asset. Now, if you have a house worth $100 that you co-own with your spouse and die, well, only 50% of that house gets that basis adjustment. Even though the house passes all to your surviving spouse, only 50% gets adjusted upwards to the fair market value. Now, the community property trust is under the community property laws and the Internal Revenue Code. It says, hey, if an asset is community property and one spouse dies, that there is a 100% basis step up on the community property asset. So that same example of that $100 house, well, if, if you have it in the community property trust and die, your spouse, the spouse that survives, now owns the house with the basis of 100 bucks. So if they sold it for $100, they pay zero capital gains tax, which is a fantastic potential benefit. And the community property trust is not limited to just real property, too. This can be used for investment accounts, anything that you have significant growth that's unrealized. The community property trust can be a very useful tool to help reduce the income tax benefits. And, you know, where some of those irrevocable trusts we were just talking about, those are really geared when you've got big estates to avoid that 40% uh, death tax. The community property trust really the size of your estate is not the critical uh, the, you know, deciding factor in whether to use it. It's, hey, do I have a lot of appreciated assets? Did I buy a bunch of property 20 years ago that have grown in value that, you know, if I sell, I'm going to have to pay a ton, but if I die, my spouse can sell them tax-free, it could be, you know, an advantageous tool for folks to use. So that's going to wrap up kind of our irrevocable and revocable trust uh, types, and I'm going to move into the estate planning mistakes. So, Jason, if you could switch to the next slide. So, first cars. This is something when I meet with clients, I would say is the most seldom known and understood by clients, married clients uh, too. Very often when you're married, the inclination is we're going to put assets in both of our names. We're going to put the car in both of our names. Well, normally that's good because like we talked about earlier, that's going to help you avoid probate, that joint ownership. The car is one of the assets that we don't ever want to have two owners on. And that for those on the call that have, you know, Children that you help buy a car, you definitely want to tune in and, and really pay attention to this part because this is very important. Florida's dangerous instrumentality doctrine basically says if your name is on the title to the vehicle, you are liable for any damage it does. So if you, know, you helped your son buy a car and you had to put your name on the title with him and your son runs me over, 
I can sue him because he was the bad driver, but I can sue you because you're the owner too. So you have increased your exposure. And when we talk about spouses, if you have a car in both of your names and run me over, well, now I can sue both spouses. And if I can sue both of you, then I can go after each of your individual assets and I can go after your joint marital assets. Whereas in Florida, from a creditor protection standpoint, normally when a married couple owns assets together as husband and wife, a spouse's individual creditor can't touch them. So very often, owning things jointly, other than the car, gives you built-in creditor protection that's not hard, complex, or expensive to have. But if you leave both names on the car title, you just open that asset up to me coming after it because you ran me over. So, you know, for those that have minor children um, under 18 that you allowed to drive, one of you had to go to the DMV and sign a card letting them drive. What you signed, you agreed to be liable for whatever they do in unlimited amounts. And unfortunately, there is no workaround for that. My best advice in that situation is the moment your son or daughter turns 18 years old, you need to make sure your title is off the vehicle. And what's important to understand is that's not gonna infect your car insurance. You guys could still be on a family plan. Everyone in the house can be on a plan. The insurance doesn't create the liability. It really is the car title that's, drive, that's gonna drive it. So it might be a pain in the butt, but 100%, I recommend looking at your car titles. Um, ironically, I you know, practice in this area, I've been practicing in this area here in Orlando since 2011. I had this conversation with my parents about how to change and update titles. They didn't do that and gave my brother like an old work truck for him to use for his landscaping business. And he, of course, got into an accident and my parents got sued. So it does happen. And in this day and age, you all see the billboards and the commercials and stuff. You're, from attorneys, you're almost guaranteed to get a letter in the mail if you're in a car accident that someone's suing you. Your car is one of your biggest liabilities for most people. So just, just think carefully on that and, and really look at the titles because that can save you a lot of headache in the future. The next big issue item I run into is Homestead. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, Homestead is quirky. The rules in Florida are very specific when you've got a minor child or a uh, spouse. So very often clients don't realize that, you know, they, you know, they remarry later in life. They have their homestead and they want to leave it to their kids. Well, they don't realize that as soon as they got married, their spouse has a right to that house. And, and if, if they don't, if they don't have spousal permission through like a nuptial, like a post-nuptial agreement or something like that, their will could say, yeah, my house goes to my kids, but Florida Constitution says, no, your spouse actually can use it for as long as they're alive, or they can elect to just take 50% of it today. So homestead is something that has to carefully be looked at uh, for clients later in life, clients that have minor children, um, and that's where that homestead trust could come into play. Now, one of the things that I, I see probably 75% or more of the time is when folks come into my office with their trust that they set up five years, 10 years ago, whatever it might be. And I say, okay, what are the assets that, that are owned by the trust? And they go, you know, A, B, and C. So, okay. So those are titled. The, that's the trust is listed on them. Well, no, they're, they're still an army, but we, we said they're in the trust. The trust has it, right? No, that's not the way it works. You know, very free. Frequently, clients don't after they create these trusts. So you just spent the time, money, and effort to have this trust put into place. But if you don't retitle your assets, you know, your bank accounts, your real property items, your investment accounts, if you don't transfer those ownerships to your trust, they're still considered part of your probate estate. So now you paid an attorney to do this trust for you. And if you die, you're going to have to, well, your family is going to be paying a probate attorney to transfer those assets through the probate system to get them over into that trust. So for those that have trusts, especially if you did them years ago, now is a great time to go back and look. It, it doesn't cost you anything. It's just go look at the titles, call the bank if you need to, talk to your advisors, and get things retitled in the trust. You know, you've already got it. Get them in there and, you know, reap the benefit that, that the trust is offering for you. Beneficiary designations is one that's very often overlooked too, as, as we've discussed earlier, besides the probate, uh, well, the probate avoidance being a major thing that you can just have it paid right out to them. 
you know, it's very often that you named the beneficiary, but you didn't name a contingent and someone dies and you didn't update it. Um, I had a situation with like that, a spouse named their spouse, spouse died first, then a surviving spouse died. There was no contingent beneficiary on a $10,000 IRA. It took $2,500 in probate fees to get that $10,000 IRA to the family. So another type of update that you can do on your own that doesn't cost you anything, just a little bit of time to go in and review and get this information. And then you just have to keep in mind going forward in the future, if you get new assets, hey, did I add a beneficiary? I need to add one. I need to name a contingent. You know, did I get a new asset? If I have a trust, hey, I want to take the title in that trust. So it's just keeping that mindset going forward so you avoid falling into, you know, any of these kind of traps. Um, you'll see it's not as often when you work with an attorney improper execution, but there is very specific rules for executing documents in Florida. And if you don't do it right, there is no, you almost executed it right. It's an all or nothing situation. You do it right and it's valid. And if it is not exactly right, everything in there gets thrown out. The court doesn't care what it says. And we're going to look at Florida's default will for you under the intestate statutes. So, you just want to be very careful when you're executing outside of the lawyer's office to make sure you're following the rules very specifically. Um, creditor exposure, you know, that's another thing that we see uh, clients, like I said earlier, think, hey, I have a trust. I'm, my assets are protected. No. Um, you know, the, the, the big thing there is, hey, if you're married, you have this opportunity to title assets jointly as husband and wife, and that gives you individualized creditor protection. So very often, again, it doesn't cost you anything to do it. You don't have to pay to set up a trust for this. You just got to go to the bank and open up a new bank account in both of your names as husband and wife. And now you have an asset bucket that you can move things into, and it's going to be exempt from the individual creditors of either spouse. When, you know, something to keep in mind whenever you're dealing with, you know, assets that are secured, like real property and stuff, if you make transfers of those items, it can sometimes trigger a due on sale clause where your lender can say, hey, uh, you got to pay us, you know, the full, full amount that's due. Typically, if lenders get paid, they're not normally looking at, you know, property records to see if you transferred it. But what I do not know, coming off of historically low interest rates and interest rates now starting to grow, could lenders be looking for opportunities to say, hey, let's get this person out of this 3% loan, tell them they got to refinance at 9% because they did a transfer and it triggered this due on sale clause. So I, I haven't seen that occur yet, but that is just something that you know intrigues me as to whether or not banks are going to start thinking like that to look at ways to increase the, that interest rate and get people out of those super low rates. Uh, other, you know, things that don't cost you anything is life insurance reviews. If you took out life insurance many years ago, it's worth sitting down with a life insurance expert. I am not a life insurance expert. I don't sell insurance. I, I don't pretend to know every different policy and writer, but that's where there are professionals that specialize in that. And sitting down with them, they can look at your old policy and say, hey, uh, based on interest rate changes, changes in actuarial tables, we can get you something better. And I recently... I took out a 30 year policy for a million bucks and I was paying, I don't know, 80 bucks a month, something like that. Uh, five years later, I had it reviewed and got a new 30 year policy, million dollar benefit, and I'm paying $60 now. So $20 less, and I just got five more years added to it. So it doesn't, didn't cost me anything to look at, and it ended up saving me money. So definitely worth looking into that. And the last one I'm just going to touch on briefly is long term care planning. Again, not an insurance expert, but there is long-term care insurance. And from what I understand, the sweet spot in looking for that is when you're in your 50s. Once you start to get uh, in your 60s and older, the cost for the long-term care policies goes up significantly, and it's, it's just less advantageous versus if you take it out earlier. So those are you know, the, the most common issues I see from clients coming into my office. And that's, you know, while they're alive, and fortunately, we have time to fix them. Unfortunately, when family comes in, after a client has died, you know, we're, we're very limited in what we can do. And often, we're looking at expensive probates or petitions with the court uh, to try to correct things. So. All right, that's, All right. that's what I had for you. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Certainly appreciate that. Um, we do have a few questions 
um, three questions. Uh, one of them, Joe, I think this is directed to you asking if can a ladybird deed be taken if they go into a home? That is a great question. So that that's, um, you're talking, I'm assuming about like Medicaid planning. So you're going to go into to a nursing home, whether it's yourself or a parent, um, can you use the ladybird deed? Does that create an issue? The answer depends a little bit. If the property is homestead, for that person that's going to be going into a facility. Homestead generally can't be taken for Medicaid purposes. It's a protected asset. So in that sense, it doesn't count against you qualifying to get into that home. And the ladybird deed is not a current transfer. So Medicaid does not look at it as though you've shifted that asset to someone else. So I, I, I don't do Medicaid planning anymore. But my colleagues that do it, the Ladybird deed is extremely popular because what you do is you get to you keep the homestead, you get you know mom or dad or whoever into the home, and then when they pass, the house will move automatically to the person named in the Ladybird deed. So it will work well for homestead properties, but if it's non-homestead like rentals or vacations or investment properties. Medicaid's still going to look at that as an available asset and say you got to you got to use that up before we're going to pay for your care. All right, thanks, Joe. Um, there's a, another question. It's a very general question. You may want to be able to touch on, but they're asking: Is there a threshold of what would be beneficial to create a trust? Um, if your assets total greater than X, should you have a trust? Uh, yeah, it's another good question. And actually, it's not the value of the assets that really impact whether or not you need to trust. Um, it, you know, the, the you, you could have $20 million, and if it's all in investment accounts and brokerage accounts and retirement accounts, you can name beneficiaries on those accounts. That avoids probate. The trust isn't going to give you a whole lot of extra benefit there. It's not as though those are public records either. You die that policy is going to pay to who you said is the beneficiary. So there's not a dollar threshold. It's more of an asset uh, type that matters. Do you own assets that are going to have to go through probate? Examples of that are your homestead, other real properties, uh, business interests. Do you own an LLC or have 10% you know, ownership in some business enterprise or partnership? Do you own uh, intangible property, copyright uh, type items and intellectual property, there's certain other items that, that you may own that will technically require probate to transfer the ownership. That's when the trust really starts to make sense based on your particular asset set. Um, the, the other situation where clients, even when they have those beneficiary designations, may choose instead to put those assets into a trust is just to make it easier for the trustees. So let's say a client has a capacity issue well, then a successor trustee takes over and they can access and use those accounts versus having to use something like a power of attorney to try to access the bank account afterwards. All right, thank you. And then we have one final question. They want to know once a will is created, do you need to file it anywhere? And how do others know that the will actually exists? Okay. Uh, Florida does not have any sort of will registry while you're alive. Uh, when someone dies, technically within 10 days of death, the will is supposed to be submitted to the courthouse, whether or not you need a probate. The original will is supposed to be sent in. But, if, but until someone dies, there is no place to put the will. So uh, typically what I tell clients is make sure family knows where you keep your estate planning documents. You don't have to tell them what you have, right? You, you don't have to say, I got these assets. You can just say, hey, in the house, in the filing cabinet under W for wills, you will find all my estate documents that you need. The other thing is if you've worked with an attorney, attorneys are always going to have copies. Um, some, some attorneys will hold the originals too. Uh, a lot of my clients will give my business card to their kids, especially when you know people that are involved are you know, far away. They live out of state. To basically say, hey, if something happens, you can contact Joe. He has copies of everything and he can talk you through next steps. All right. 
Thank you. Um, I think that's it in terms of the questions in the chat. <clears throat> Hopefully you all have learned something today and that you leave here with a few takeaways. And if you have more involved questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to one of us after the webinar. Um, our contact information, I thought it was on the screen, uh, but we'll be sure to get that to you in a follow-up email so that uh, we can address any questions uh, that you have. Um, again, this webinar is being recorded. You will receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording for future reference, as well as the slides. There were some questions about, are the slides available? Yes, those will be available for you as well. So just be on the lookout for a follow-up email. At that, we'll have our contact information as well as information on how you could access the recorded web webinar as well as our slides. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, we certainly appreciate your time today.